bonds are not meant to be broken. And you're gonna wanna be bonding with the bottom of a wine bottle after this story because oh my God. Tonight, you'll see those same twin sisters admit to brutally killing their mother. We're exploring the tale of two sinister sisters with a bond that takes a deadly turn. Welcome to Wine and Crime Time, where we drink heavily and judge humans behaving badly. The year is 1993. Meet Jasmia and Tasmia Whitehead, identical twin sisters who grew up in Decatur, Georgia. Their mother's name is Jarmika Whitehead, but she preferred to be called Nikki. Not really sure why, but Nikki. So Nikki was just 17 years old when she gave birth to twin baby girls. Nikki had a pretty rough childhood. She was also born to a young mother named Linda Whitehead, and Linda was literally in jail when she gave birth to Nikki. So Nikki is raised by her grandmother, Della Frazier. And when she became pregnant at 17, Della steps in to become the primary caretaker of Nikki's baby girls, Jasmia and Tasmia. Now, Nikki made sure to be a part of the girl's life. They kind of thought of her as like an aunt or a big sister of some sort, and Della was actually really happy to be raising her great granddaughters. She made sure their lives were packed with a bunch of different activities to keep them occupied, like ballet, music lessons, Girl Scouts, and Nikki would always be sure to contribute so the financial burden wasn't all on her grandma Della. Nikki goes to cosmetology school and ends up becoming an amazing hairstylist. She was great at her job. She made sure the girls were really well cared for. They had the nicest things. They had access to the best school programs and they seemed to be living a really good life. Everyone loved the twins. They studied hard. They got straight A's in school. They were really sweet, likable girls, but apparently Della would undermine Nikki in front of the girls a lot. In fact, Linda, Della and Nikki all had difficult relationships with one another, but they all seemed to really just put their differences aside and focus on what was best for the girls. When Nikki was 25, she started dating 55-year-old Robert Head. Robert was a long-haul truck driver out of Conyers, Georgia, a suburb right outside of Atlanta. Robert's driving job took him out of the neighborhood, so he wasn't home a lot. He treated Nikki really well, though, and the two of them enjoyed an open relationship. After six years together, he asked Nikki to move in with him. He really just genuinely wanted all of them to be a family together. And Nikki, at this time, felt like she was ready for that kind of stability. She was ready to be the primary caretaker for her girls, so she made it a priority to get custody of her now 13-year-old daughters. She's feeling really excited, like she's finally doing things right, and this is gonna be a great move for them, right? Well, if they all lived happily ever after, we wouldn't be here. The problem with Nikki's plan is that the girls don't want to go. They don't want to move in with Robert. They don't want to live with their mom. They just want to stay with their great grandma, Della. But even though the girls are resisting, Nikki is still granted custody. So they pack up and move into Robert's home in Conyers. It was around this time that the twins' behavior did a total 180. Things go totally south. Their grades started to slip and they were becoming increasingly hostile. Nikki's like, uh-uh, we are not doing this. So she tries putting some rules in place, but the girls are not having it. They're like, you haven't even raised us and now you're trying to come in and give us all these rules? Despite all the challenges, Nikki is determined to break the cycle. Nikki experienced a rough youth herself, so she strives for a better future for her girls and she's really just trying to keep them on a positive path. They aren't doing well in school, they're hanging out with dusty boys, and she figures they're using drugs, so she's like, nope, I gotta set these girls straight. Based on Nikki's assumptions, she attempts to discipline them, which is just making matters worse, and they soon go from angry to violent. The girls would physically attack Nikki when she established boundaries that they disagreed with. This led to multiple police interventions. It got to a point where Nikki realized like, okay, my kids are crazy as all hell. They're gonna go back to live with their great grandma because nope, I'm all set. <laughs> and so she sends them back to live with Della, which is where their friends were, all the stability and everything else. And so to Jasmia and Tasmia, they register this as, oh great. So if we're just awful to our mom, we get to go to where we wanna be, cool. So they did end up having to go to court for assaulting their mom, but again, they were just sent back to live with Della for a while, so they didn't really have bad consequences. And so this is where the power struggle really starts to form in this family. Nikki wants custody, but Della doesn't really want to give up custody, and the twins want to live with Della, 
but they're clearly raging psychopaths while they're living with her. So the court issues them mandatory family counseling and eventually the girls end up back in Nikki's custody and then the violence continues. Nikki would call 911 over and over again. Police were familiar with the three of them fighting and would frequently make visits to the house. The girls would go back to live with Della, but one of the family counselors that worked with them said that they should be living with Nikki and that the constant swiping between houses was just causing more problems. So in January 2010, Jasmia and Tasmia are now 16 years old and the judge grants Nikki custody of the girls once more. A family conference is set up for about two weeks after the girls moved back in so that they could reevaluate the situation and see how everything was going. The girls had to go live with their mom and the order was effective immediately. The girls are also forced to switch high schools during this time. And like high school girls can already be a special kind of awful, but when you add all this other craziness to the mix, they're just like the worst. But Nikki is honestly trying to be a good mom and just take care of her responsibilities. She's literally trying to get these kids on a good path while they're trying to burn the world down and she's like, teenagers, right? So anyway, sure enough, just a week after moving in, police are called to the house on two different occasions for disturbances between the girls and their mom. But Nikki was going to great lengths to make the girls feel at home. She even threw them a welcome home party with the whole family that ended up with Jasmia throwing food and shoving her aunt into a wall. It felt like every time Nikki was trying to do something good, it just made the situation worse. So like, what was she supposed to do? Now remember, they're all living at Robert's house, but he's never there. So this whole time, it's just the girls and their mom in the house with tensions that are through the roof. On January 13th, 2010, just a little over a week since the girls were forced to move back in with Nikki, a police officer was patrolling the neighborhood when he sees Tasmia frantically running out of their house. She's waving her arms trying to get him to stop. She's screaming and crying and tells the officer that she and her sister had just come home from school and when they walked in, they saw all this blood and found their mother murdered. So he follows Tasmia into the house. He said when he entered the house, it was an absolute horror show. There was tons of blood and Nikki's dead body was submerged in the master bathtub with 80 stab wounds. There was an obvious sign of struggle and she had fought hard for her life. So obviously the girls were taken down to the police station for questioning. And when they were there, they were questioned together. They stated that that morning they had woken up a little late. They missed their school bus and so they ended up walking to school. What time did y'all leave the house this morning? We missed the bus, so we had to walk. You walked all the way to Rockdale? It's not, it's not far. far. About what time did you leave? 7. They claim they made it to school on time, went to all of their classes, and then took the bus on their way home. Upon walking into the house was where they found the bloody scene. The twins claimed that they had no idea what had happened. They were very upset and crying a lot. Oh my grandma, oh my mama. Even the police officers felt sad and believed them, at least for a moment. Well, not until something strange caught the eyes of one of the officers. He said that most people would take off their gloves when they walked in. So he found it strange when he noticed that the twins kept their mittens on during questioning. So he asked them to take their mittens off, and when they do, he notices they both have scratches on their hands. They explained that the scratches were from a fight they had gotten into with each other, but that they were just messing around. The girls are visibly very traumatized, but they're prime suspects. Police knew this wasn't a typical break-in by a stranger because Nikki was stabbed over 80 times, which usually indicates the murderer was by someone she knew. The mother was stabbed some 80 times. That's sending a message. And was likely full of rage. Robert was out of state, so they knew it wasn't him. So then they decided to look at another one of Nikki's boyfriends. Remember, they had an open relationship. This was a man by the name of Joe Carter who worked in the barbershop next to Nikki's salon. And according to the twins, Nikki and Joe had gotten into a really big argument over the phone the night before. She lived with uh, Robert and she also ha had a boyfriend named Joe. The twins had indicated that Robert had uh, overheard her speaking to the other boyfriend on the phone. And, and indicated that Robert had uh, confronted Nikki uh, about uh, the infidelity. So police are thinking, you know, like maybe he kept the fight going and ended up killing Nikki the next day or something. According to the twins, the fight the night before ended with Nikki and Joe breaking up. 
So it seems like Joe could have been their best bet. The police questioned Joe and he let the detectives take a look at his body to see if there were any injuries. Remember, Nikki's death indicated that there was an intense struggle. So they check him out and find nothing. His DNA was collected and they also gave him a polygraph test, which he passed. Joe and Robert were completely cleared of her murder. They both had nothing to connect them to the murder. The only two people left that are close to her and have had this much hate towards her are the twins. This seems like a no brainer at this point with all the domestic disturbances and the scratches on the hands, but you know, protocol. So the police were able to get video footage from a shell station that was along the route from Robert's house to the twins' new school, where they claimed they had made it on time. One of the twins uh, uh, we observed in the back of the ambulance, we saw her um, bite her arm. Uh, they said they had missed the bus and ended up walking to school that day, but the video footage determined that was a lie. On the video footage from the gas station, the twins could be seen walking by at around 10, 15 in the morning, and then a car drives up and shadows can be seen in the car. A man appears to give them a ride to school because about three minutes later after the gas station footage, there is footage of the girls arriving at their high school in the same car from the previous video. They both walked into the school. It's not known if this was a stranger or a family member, but what matters is that the walk and this ride leaves about two to three hour gaps in that time frame. This was a massive hole in their alibis because school obviously doesn't start at 1015. So where were they? Police then ordered their dental records to see if they could match their teeth to bite marks found on Nikki's body. We had a, a dental examination of, of Nikki's teeth uh, and they matched it to the bite on the twin. Police officers noted that Tasmia had bite marks on her arm the day of Nikki's murder. When asked about it, Tasmia said, it's part of her coping mechanism when she's stressed. She bites her arm. And she also added that she'd gotten into a fight at school and gotten bitten during that as well. The last piece of hard evidence was a broken vase found at the crime scene. They found the DNA of Nikki as well as both of the twins on the vase since Jasmia and Tasmia have the exact same DNA. It took police four months for them to collect all the evidence and draw their conclusions, which is actually insanely long when you consider all of the evidence that was piled up against these girls. But finally on May 16th, 2010, the twins were brought back in for questioning and that's when they cracked and confessed to their mother's murder. So then the girls were split up and two separate confessions were taken. And even though the girls were apart, their confessions were almost exactly the same and they were arrested and charged with murder. During Jasmia's trial, the prosecutor said that the girls had woken up late, went downstairs to the kitchen and found their mother there upset about them waking up for school and that's when an argument started. A fight with their mother after waking up late Nikki allegedly attacked Tasmia with a pot and in self-defense, the twins wrestled the pot away, igniting a full-blown brawl. She just started waving the pot around, the thing is like that or whatever it is. So I guess she trying to hit us with the pot, you know, she just threatening us. Nikki then grabbed a steak knife, urging the girls to keep their distance. Um, just, just went in that, that battle with the knife or whatever, so I, I picked up the pot. The confrontation escalated as they moved to the living room. Jasmia retaliated by striking her mother's head with a red vase, prompting Nikki to fight back in the face of bloodshed. Tasmia then proceeds to pick up the knife and stabs Nikki. After all the biting, punching, screaming, and stabbing, the twins drag their mother into the bathtub. There was evidence to support that Tasmia was the one who did the stabbing. And in addition to the cuts and bites on her arm, she had a deep cut on her finger that was consistent with the sharp blade of a knife. Now this is where it gets weird. According to the prosecutors, Tasmia said after the first initial fight with the pot and the knife, Nikki actually left the house. Running out of the house with the cordless phone in her hand, hysterical. I pulled up, asked her what happened, there was evidence to support this claim because investigators found drops of blood on the wall next to the neighbor's front door. It seems like she may have gone there to seek help, but no one answered. Tasmia said Nikki returned after leaving the house and sat down because she was exhausted, and then her mom lunched for the same night that they were fighting with previously, and the fight sort of just continued. 
During their separate trials, both girls pleaded guilty and were convicted on three counts of voluntary manslaughter. They were also guilty of falsification of government matters and possession of a knife in connection with a crime. They were each given a total of 30 years in prison. Brenda, we pick up almost exactly four years after the crime, the twins about to go to trial. Instead, they accept a 30-year sentence and start talking about what actually happened the morning of the murder. Nikki's mother, Linda, has since said that she witnessed Jasmia go up to Nikki at one point and told her, quote, if I have to go live with you again, I'm going to kill you. And two weeks later, Nikki was killed. Linda believes her mother, Della, had manipulated the girls and their situation with Nikki in a lot of ways. She had unhealthy control over those girls and must have turned them against her mother at some point. Despite everything, Della thinks the girls were pushed to their breaking point and is still standing firmly 100% in the girls' corner. She speaks of them now as if they're thriving despite being in prison. She's announced that both girls obtained their GEDs, Tasmia is currently studying computer tech, and Jasmia is in the medical field. Worked really, really, really hard. I stayed up all night some days to finish some of the things they gave me. There have been two wildly different opinions people have on the Jazz and Taz Whitehead case. Some believe the situation was abusive and they were just responding to their environment, while others think they're spoiled little brat murderers who didn't want to listen to their mom. Either way, Nikki Whitehead is sorely missed by those who knew her. Friends have come out to speak on how loving and outgoing she was, and their community continues to be shocked at what happened to her to this day. So what do you think? Crazy psycho brats, abused teens, or maybe a little bit of both? Let us know in the comments. Also, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more true crime cases weekly. Thanks for tuning in to Wine and Crime Time, and we'll see you in the next video. Toodaloo!